Okay, I think we're on with the record. So uh, it's my pleasure for all of you who made it today to welcome you for really one of my favorite people when it comes to talking about baseball. But if I could be so bold, I'm going to say one of my favorite people. And that's Bob Kendrick. He's the president of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City. Uh, I think when we look at the difficult times that all of us are facing and just the state of the world around us, there's probably no better person to lift our spirits than Bob. And if he needs to, he'll be channeling uh, the memory and legend of the late, great Buck O'Neill to help him do that. So, so with that, Bob, I will simply turn it over to you for Buck O'Neill, a Chicago story. I'll let our attendees know that afterward, we'll hopefully have some time for some questions and I'll unmute folks as needed to make that work. Sounds good, Jason. Thanks so much, man. And, and thank you all of you who kind of tune in to hear this conversation and for the opportunity to do so. And thanks to all of you who are friends and supporters of Bucks Museum, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And as I oftentimes call this place, the house that Buck built. And, and guys, I say that with no disrespect to anyone who had anything to do with the building of this great museum, but it would not have happened without the foresight of the legendary Buck O'Neill. To kind of paint the quick picture of that foresight, the year was 1990, when a group of concerned individuals met in the historic Lincoln Building directly across the street. I'm actually in my office today. So directly across the street from where the museum operates is the historic Lincoln Building. And led by Buck O'Neill, they were in an office probably about half the size of my office. That office had a conference room table and guys like Buck O'Neill and other local Negro leaguers who were still with us at that time, literally took turns paying the monthly rent to keep the little office open. Man, that's how we got started. Uh huh. And it kept alive our hopes and dreams of one day building a facility that would pay rightful tribute to not only one of the great chapters in baseball history, but as you all well know, one of the greatest chapters in American history. And that's the story of the Negro League. But you also have to understand that here at Historic 18th and Vine, where the museum operates today, it was like a lot of urban areas, you know, the South Side in Chicago. It had died. It had been left abandoned. And here was Buck coming along saying, we're going to build a museum at Historic 18th and Vine when there was absolutely nothing at Historic 18th and Vine except the Lincoln Building. So as you can well imagine, even our most ardent supporters looked at Buck and said, you're crazy. You know, why in the world would you build a museum there when there's nothing else there? The question was, who's going to come see you? And, and it's a legitimate question because it, it had been abandoned. It had been left to die. And thanks to the infinite wisdom of the legendary John Jordan Buck O'Neill, who was very defiant in saying, this is where we will build this museum. And in doing so, we will resurrect a community that was once a very proud, prominent African-American community. 30 years later, we haven't looked back. And, and today the museum is recognized as America's national Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. People are once again living, working, and playing at historic 18th and Vine. And it's all due to that foresight of Buck O'Neill, who was one of the most influential people in my life, both as professionally, personally. He was a great friend, a mentor, a confidant. And as I talk to you guys today on what is the actual ninth anniversary of me starting back at the Negro Leagues Museum. Yeah, this, I started back on, on April the 11th of uh, 2011. My first day in the office was April 11, 2011. So Happy said, anniversary. Yeah, man, I'm sorry. Ooh, and they said it would never last. And they said it would never last. Nine years later, I'm still here, still trying to figure it out, but still trying to make bucks, keep bucks work alive. And, and so he just had that foresight. And, and you have to understand, for us, it was never a self-serving proposition. It was always about the greater good. And so if you understand Negro Leagues Baseball, wherever you had successful 
black baseball, you had thriving black economies. And, and Kansas City was no exception. And, and so 18th and Vine, where we operate, man, 18th and Vine in its heyday was as recognized street cross section as you'll meet anywhere in the world. The place was jumping. Uh huh. And so here we are in this age of where we so oftentimes are looking forward to the future. And here in Kansas City, we are looking at returning 18th and Vine back to what it used to be when it was alive and jumping. And that all starts again with Buck O'Neill. And, and so I'm going to take you back to one of the most, and I don't really even know how to describe it because it was one of the most disappointing days for me personally and professionally, but it was also one of the most inspirational days that I think I've ever encountered. And, and that was the day, February 27, 2006, when Buck O'Neill learns that he's not going to be inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. And so if you're familiar at all with this story, the Hall of Fame had put together a committee of Negro League historians, researchers, and educators who were, had been assembled to make a kind of, I guess, final decision on all the players from the Negro Leagues who deserve to be in. And they had whittled this list down to 35 or so who had made the final ballot uh, as it relates to Chicago, the great city of Chicago. My dear friend, the late great Minnie Minoso was on that final ballot and, and Buck O'Neill. And actually they were the only two living names on that list of 30 plus that had made that final ballot. Well, this committee had gathered down in Tampa, Florida. And so Buck O'Neill and I left home the morning of February 27, 2006, with suitcases packed, with airline tickets that the Hall of Fame had purchased for us. That's how sure we were that Buck was going to get in the Hall of Fame. This is a mere formality. Yeah, and, and so Buck is in our conference room and he's entertaining a bunch of people. My dear friend, the great sports writer, Joe Posnanski, in the room with him. At that time, guys, I was the marketing director for the museum. And so as marketing director, I had brokered a deal with our partner, Sprint. So Buck has his Sprint phone. I've got my Sprint phone. We gonna take the Hall of Fame call on the Sprint phone, and then Sprint's gonna pay us a bunch of money to build a Buck O'Neill Education and Research Center. Absolutely brilliant, if I have to say so myself. And so <laughs> the call was supposed to come to me that morning at 10 o'clock. Well, 10 o'clock rolls around, I don't get a phone call. Finally, about noon, my colleague, Raymond Doswell, who was one of the 12 members gathered in Tampa. Ray is the vice president of curatorial services here at the museum. Uh, at that time, he was functioning just in the role as curator. Well, he was one of the voting members. He calls me and he says, well, Bob, this thing is looking tight. We just did straw vote and Buck is coming up one vote shot. Former commissioner Faye Vincent, who over, he was overseeing the committee, but he didn't have a vote. Ray says he's reconvened us so that we can talk specifically about Buck O'Neill and Minnie Minoso. Again, the only two guys alive on the list. I called my friend Joe Posnanski out of the conference room. I said, hey man, I just got a call from Ray. He says, this thing is looking tight. They just did strong vote. Buck is coming up a vote shot. They've just gone back in to talk again about Minnie Minoso and Buck. He's in disbelief. Well, finally about two o'clock, Jeff Idelson, who was then the vice president of marketing for the National Baseball Hall of Fame. He just recently retired as president of the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Jeff calls me and he says, Bob, Buck didn't get enough votes. And y'all, I felt like someone had kicked me in my gut. Because now I got to go back in this conference room and tell my friend that he didn't get enough votes when I know in his heart he thought he was in. Why wouldn't he? And so I go in, I excuse a few folks. Buck is seated at the head of the table. Joe Paz is on this side of the table. I go to the opposite side and I am literally trying to collect myself 
because I don't know how I'm going to tell him. And so finally, I sit there and I finally look up at Buck. I said, well, Buck, we didn't get enough votes. And he looks up at me and he smiles. He said, that's how the cookie crumbles. And in the next voice, he asked me how many had gotten in. I said, 17. Now, I'll be honest. I was furious because in my mind, you couldn't put 17 in and leave Buck out. He hits the table in utter jubilation. He is excited that 17 of his colleagues had gotten their place in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. He asked me who they were. And, and I didn't have that information at that point in time. And the next words that came out of his mouth, I wonder if the Hall of Fame will invite me to speak. And, and so I'm in disbelief. And I said, well, Buck, I need, and Joe Posnansky looks at Buck and he says, Buck, you wouldn't do that, would you? Buck says, Joe, of course I would. What has my life been about? I said, well, Buck, I need to go downstairs. And for any of you who've been here to the museum, downstairs on what we call the field of legends, where we have these life-size statues of Negro League greats and they're cast in position as if they were playing a game. Buck, almost poetically, is on the outside looking in because all the statues on the field represent players who are in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Matter of fact, the first group of Negro Leaguers to be inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Buck is on the outside looking in because he's managing this great all-star team that we had assembled. So I said, Buck, I need to go downstairs. I need you to deliver the news. I'll come back and get you. And I think you should address the group. It's been a long day. Well, y'all, as I so oftentimes tell this story, from our upstairs conference room, where I'm, I'm adjacent to that room right now, to the field of legends was the longest walk of my life. I am literally trying to coach myself. Bob, you can't cry. Whatever you do, you can't cry. This is your job. You got to suck it up. The more I'm telling myself not to cry, tears are steady building in my eyes. We had the podium at second base on the field. And y'all, this is the honest to God's truth. I have yet to go back and watch the video. I have no idea what in the world I said, but whatever I said, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. People were openly emotional. And this wasn't disappointment. This was anger. This was outrage. You know, this was a travesty in the eyes of those who had gathered, and I think in the eyes of baseball fans worldwide. Well, Buck walks in through our gift shop, and the room erupts into this thunderous ovation. And, and for lack of a better term, oh, Buck walks up to the podium, and he delivers one of the most amazing concession speeches that I've ever heard. What he did that day was he literally implored all of us not to be angry, not to be bitter, not to express any ill will toward anyone who had anything to do with this decision. He said, I had an opportunity. And in this great country of ours, that's all you could ever ask. They didn't think old Buck was good enough. We got to live with that. But if I'm a Hall of Famer in your eyes, that's all that matters to me. Just keep on loving old Buck. Now, I'm over in the corner at this point in time. I'm an absolute wreck. Tears are free flowing down my face. And, but what Buck O'Neill taught us that day was a tremendously valuable lesson on how to, dis, how to handle disappointment. Yeah, he literally reached out his arms, wrapped them around all of us, and said, it's OK. And instead of us consoling him, He's consoling us in what I still say to be one of the most amazing displays of strength of character that I'd ever witnessed. He would push aside his own disappointment because I think there are those who believe because he handled it so gracious, so gracefully and so graciously that he wasn't disappointed. Of course he was disappointed. The Hall of Fame, as you all well know, is the pinnacle. And he wanted to be there, but he wasn't going to be so disappointed that he'd be sullen for those who had gotten their place. 
And so he pushed aside his own disappointment, would go to Cooperstown, deliver this incredible speech on behalf of 17 dead folks who did not have a voice. Yeah, I, and I'll be honest, I still don't know what the group was thinking about. Man, you can't have a celebration with dead folks, and particularly dead folks that no one knew, and that's no disrespect to any of them. Buck O'Neill made you care about those people. And so to me, the two people, Buck O'Neill and Minnie Minoso, gives you cause for celebration because they are alive. And there's Buck speaking on behalf of those who didn't have a voice. And I still say that it is the most selfless act in American sports history. The world was saying, this should be your induction speech. And there he was speaking on behalf of those who didn't have a voice. A little over two months later, O'Buck passed away himself at age 94, a month shy of his 95th birthday. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, what Buck taught us that day was this tremendously valuable lesson on how to handle disappointment. And I still have to remind myself that Buck O'Neill not getting in the Hall of Fame pales in comparison to some of the things that this man and others who looked like him playing this game had to endure. And, and Buck knew that he didn't need the Hall of Fame to define him. He was a very self-assured individual. So he didn't need the Hall of Fame to define him. And I think there are those who will say that the Hall of Fame needed Buck just as much as Buck needed the Hall of Fame. But he wanted it not as much for him, but for us. And, and, and at that time, I think Buck knew that he was sick. He never, ever complained, not one time. He knew he was sick and that this was going to be his swan song. It was going to be the thing that would propel his museum into perpetuity. And so that was the reason why he wanted it. Uh, and, and so, but he would not allow his heart to be hardened with hate or to say anything disparaging about those who, who did get their rightful place in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. And, and I tell people all the time, I'm trying to be more buck-like. I ain't there yet. I am still a work in progress. I'm still working. But that spirit, his spirit, absolutely is here at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And, and when Buck O'Neill passed away, I, I, I'll never forget this. He died on Friday, February the 6th. And I had just left the meeting. I played a round of golf earlier that day. And then I, and we went to a meeting with the barbecue baron, Ali Gates. Ali Gates leads a group here called the Enshriners. And the Enshriners were meeting to determine whether or not they were going to make a gift to help us build the Buck O'Neill Center. Well, they do. They pledge $50,000 that night for the Buck O'Neill Center. And so my drive home took me right by the hospital that Buck was in. But it was a little late. And I said to myself then, you know, you ought to stop by and see Buck. Well, at that time, he might recognize you. He might not. And, and so you knew that, you, know, you knew what you were dealing with. You, you knew that the final days were coming. And, and so, as you guys can well imagine, that was a difficult time for me because, again, you're balancing professional and personal. So, you know, you always had to put on a good face. You were trying to be optimistic about what you knew medically wasn't really looking favorable. Uh, and, and so, instead of stopping, I just went on home. And, guys, I wasn't home a good hour when I, his friend, Evelyn Belzer, the late Evelyn Belzer, calls me and says, he's gone. And now I got to go to work. You know, I, I mean, it's time to go to work now. And by the time, of course, this breaks out to the news, you know, the media is calling. And Joe Posnanski, I called Joe uh, and let him know. And it was really interesting because I think we both, by the time Joe got his article in to meet deadline at Kansas Star, and they had already started working, as many do with celebrities, writing these obituaries before they pass away. Anyway, but Joe didn't do that. He couldn't do that. Not for his friend Buck O'Neill. And he penned one of the most eloquent pieces uh, ever about Buck as Buck's obituary that appeared in that next day's Kansas City Star. And, and I'm doing one interview after another. And I think we both said, we laid down to finally try and close our eyes and go to sleep almost about the same time. And, and literally at that point in time, there's this just overwhelming emotion that came over me. 
And then the very next day, of course, we had press conference here at the museum. And now you got to go back to work. Well, Friday, February 13th was his wake here at the museum. And so we had a, we decided that we would allow the public to come to the museum. And I'll be honest, y'all, I grapple with whether or not we should open the coffin or not. And then finally, it just, in, in coordination with the family, we decided that it was only fitting that people would have the opportunity to pay their proper respect to Buck. So we opened the coffin. And that morning, it, the viewing was going to start at 7 a.m. that morning. I got here about 6.30 or so. And there was this anxious feeling that was really kind of over me. And, and I'm, I'm really nervous about this. And, and so I go in to kind of have my quiet time with Buck. And it was amazing. This overwhelming calm came over me. Yeah, it, it, it was so eerie. All that angst and anxiety that I had prior, the minute I walk in to see him, now I'm overcome with this overwhelming level of calm. And it was almost like he says, it's going to be OK. And so at that point in time, now you're ready. All right, we open the doors. And do you know that day, over 15,000 people came to say goodbye to Buck? See, we knew that Buck's passing would be one of the biggest things to ever happen in this organization's history. And it was. And I wasn't, to be frank, I wasn't surprised by the sheer number of people. But man, where they came from gives you an indication of who Buck O'Neill was. These were CEOs of major corporations. They were political dignitaries. They were sports stars. They were street hustlers. They were homeless. They were black. They were white. They were men. They were women. They were young. They were old. They all had to come by and say goodbye to Buck. And it gives you an indication of who he was. Buck O'Neill related to everyone. And when I say homeless, I mean they were homeless. Yeah, they came in with their last belongings in their arms. Because Buck oftentimes took food to those folks. And so it was as amazing thing, I think, as I've ever seen. And, and I think, you know, our final farewell to Buck was one of the things that I think I will always be the most proudest of. And our, we had a service the next day, a private funeral service. And here in Kansas City, his church, Bethel AME, is right next to a highway called 71 Highway. They closed the highway. They closed the entire highway from where you get on at his church to where his final resting grounds at Forest Hill Cemetery. As a matter of fact, he and Satchel lay at rest in the same cemetery. And, and so we have his service. And then that evening, we do a memorial service uh, at, at the uh, Barter Hall Convention Center here in Kansas City. And Ken Burns was there and Ernie Banks and Lou Brock. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. And it really was a celebration, but would not have wanted us mourning. And even over his final days, when I went to see him in the hospital, he wouldn't let you feel sorry for him. You know, he said, man, I'm 94 years old. I've lived a wonderful life. And, 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 and again, instead of me trying to lift his spirits, he's lifting my spirits. And, and so it gives you an indication of who this man was. And I, and I say that because I used to ask Buck, I said, Buck, where did it come from? Where did this innateness, this ability to forgive, this unbridled, I think, love of people, where did it come from? And you know what he would tell me? He said, my daddy told me to treat every man the way you want to be treated. The golden rule. Y'all, we all know the golden rule. We don't all live the golden rule, but we all know it. And he took something that his father said when he was a boy, and it governed his life for the rest of that wonderful 94 years that he was on this earth. And of course, he comes here to Kansas City in 1938 to join the great Kansas City mob. And one of the interesting things about it, Wilkinson had set up this deal with the Memphis Red Sox 
that they would send Buck to Kansas City. Well, you know who took Buck's place in Memphis? The great Goose Tatum. Reese Goose Tatum. Double Duty Ratcliffe was managing the Memphis Red Sox. He brings in Goose Tatum. They send Buck to Kansas City. Buck was in Kansas City from 1938 until the day he died in 2006. And, and, and of course, he would become a fixture here with the great Kansas City Monarchs, playing here from 38 to 55. Great first baseman. I remember we were sitting in the conference room, and everybody's coming in the conference room saying, oh, what a great ambassador you are to the, for the game of baseball in 2006 when we were preparing for the Hall of Fame. Great ambassador. You've done this. You've done that. And I think Buck got a little tired of that, you know, because he finally looked up and said, hey, I could play. Y'all keep talking about all this ambassador stuff. I could play. And he could play. Lifetime 288 hit a line drive, you know, first baseman, line drive power. So he didn't have the power that the Buck Leonard of the Negro Leagues had, but he was a line drive, one batting title in the Negro Leagues. Great defensive first baseman. Yeah, he had a couple seasons where he only made one error in the entire season. If you, if you had met Buck, he had huge hands, huge hands, and, and just a great baseball mind. Yeah, George Altman, who spent many years there in Chicago, played for Buck 1955 here for the Kansas City Monarchs and then goes on to play for the Cubs and then several other teams. He still says today that Buck O'Neill was the greatest manager that he ever played for. Greatest manager he ever played for. He just said Buck had, he knew how to handle men. He knew when to put his arm around you. He knew when to kick you in your rump. You know, he knew exactly when and how and what to do when it was needed. And he was a great baseball mind. And, and so he has a wonderful career here for the Kansas City Monarchs. You know, he tells me that his favorite team was the 1942 Kansas City Monarchs. And, and if you can see, the batting helmet, and right behind me is the 1942 cap. Uh, that was that year. You, if you saw the film Sandlot, that's the cap that the kid is wearing in the film Sandlot, which a lot of people didn't realize until 25 years later that that was the Monarchs cap. He says that was his, his favorite team. And I can tell y'all now, it was a great team. That 42 team had three Hall of Famers in Satchel Page, Hilton Smith, and the great Willett Brown. You had a second tier of guys in Ted Strong and Buck O'Neill uh, who were dynamite, you know. And, and so they swept the powerful Homestead Grays. And, and they, you know, the Homestead Grays had Buck Leonard and Josh Gibson, Gibson batting three and four in what was a juggernaut offensive lineup. But the 42 Monarchs guys had one of the greatest pitching staffs, not in Negro Leagues history, but in baseball history, because they had Satchel, they had Hilton Smith, and if you haven't heard the name Hilton Smith, Hilton Smith did something that I don't think we will ever see done again in the game of baseball. Hilton Smith won 20 games or more, 12 consecutive years. He was straight up dealing, and Buck swore to the day he died the greatest curveball he ever saw. Monty Irvin said it dropped off the table. You know, he said you would know it was coming and you couldn't hit it because the break was so sharp on it and he could throw it from, he could throw it from up here, he could drop down here, hell, he could even drop down submarine and throw it. And he had a great fastball to complement that great breaking ball. And, and as a reporter once asked Buck, he said, well, Buck, how do you hit a great curveball? Buck said, you don't miss the fastball because you don't, <laughs> you don't hit a great curveball. And even if you hit a great curveball, the pitcher going to swear, it wasn't my best curveball. And, and so that team was dominant. They swept the Homestead Grays, and he always said that was his favorite team. And then, of course, after the 55 season, he had already made a deal with the Cubs to come to Chicago. And, and, and of course, by the time you get to 55, everybody knew that the Negro Leagues were about to go out of business. It wasn't a matter of if, it was simply a matter of when. And, and really, that started to happen the minute that Jackie Robinson was signed in to organize baseball by the Brooklyn Dodgers. I think all the Negro League owners saw the handwriting on the wall. 
by 55, Negro Leagues baseball was just a shell of itself. And so Buck had arranged the deal to go to the Cubs as a scout. And as you all well know, when he comes to Chicago, he brought Ernie Banks to the Kansas City Monarchs. He arranged really for Ernie to go join the Cubs. Um, he had Gene Baker here with him for the Monarchs. And so your, your legendary double play combination there in Chicago were both former Kansas City Monarchs. Yeah, Baker to Banks. And, and Gene Baker should have been a manager in this sport uh, well before Frank Robinson becomes the first official full-time black manager. Gene Baker was astute. He was an astute, a tremendous student of the game and uh, very cerebral. And so all these guys played for Buck. And so he finally joins the Cubs and, of course, Ernie Banks and subsequently Lou Brock. And, of course, he's credited for bringing Billy Williams back to the Cubs. Yeah, Billy had quit. Billy had left spring training in, in San Antonio. He had gotten fed up with some of the, the, the social stuff. You know, he, he couldn't handle it. Not being able to go into restaurants and eat, that kind of stuff. And, and so Billy had gone back home to Whistler, Alabama. And the Cubs sent Buck to go get him. And Billy says he looks out in his driveway one day and there's Buck O'Neill driving an old Plymouth Fury. Uh, you know, Buck drove that old Plymouth Fury all over the country, scouting at that time. And Buck says he goes out and he picks Billy up and he takes him to where Billy used to play ball. And everybody's excited to see Billy Williams. Billy Williams is major leader, you know, and, and they're all aspiring to be like Billy Williams. And, and so Buck says after two or three days of that, Billy looks at him and he says, well, Buck, I'm ready to go back. And so the Cubs wanted him to put him on the bus and send him back to San Antonio. Buck says, nope, I'm going to drive him back to San Antonio. And he did, from Whistler, Alabama, to San Antonio, Texas. Billy Williams would become sweet swinging Billy Williams, Hall of Famer Billy Williams. And he will tell you today he owes his career to the legendary Buck O'Neill. Buck also brought you Lee Arthur Smith, who I'm just absolutely thrilled that is now in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Joe Carter, who I hope one day will get into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Oscar Gamble, yeah, Sweet Lou Johnson. These are all Buck's guys that he brought with him or uh, shaped or signed to come there to Chicago to play. And so Buck has had an indelible imprint on baseball history there in Chicago. And, and, and of course, in 1962, he would become the major's first full-time black coach. And, and he was obviously very proud of what he had accomplished. But the thing that he shared with me, and I think it's so poignant, and, and it's so apropos to Buck O'Neill, he said, man, I couldn't stick out my chest because I'm the first black coach in baseball, Major League Baseball, when I knew all of these great minds who were more than capable of waving a guy home. And so his perspectives were always so interesting. And, and so, you know, his affiliation there was always something that he was proud of. He got to be, he got the opportunity to play in East West All-Star Games there in Chicago. And Chicago was a big city. Chicago was a big city. And, and for those East-West All-Star Games, Black folks would come from as far west as Los Angeles by train, as far south as New Orleans by train, as far east as New York by train, converging on Chicago for what was the biggest sporting event, one of the biggest sporting events in American sports history that nobody knows very much about. And that was the East-West All-Star Game debuted the same year as Major League Baseball's All-Star Game. And yes, it did outdraw Major League Baseball's All-Star Game. Because y'all, they would put over 50,000 fans in Chicago's Comiskey Park for the Negro League version of the All-Star Game. And, and, and Buck said it was the showcase event. People would come there and do their winter shopping because the South Side was so, it was so much bristling with activity that there were stores plentiful.
for black folks to shop. Whereas in New Orleans and some of these other places where segregation had been so prevalent that if you went in and you touched the hat, you had to buy the hat. They let you in, but if you touched the hat, you had to buy it. If you touched the suit, you had to buy it. No less talk about trying it on. But then when they got to Chicago, on the south side of Chicago, you had all these haberdasheries and other places. You could go be your natural self. You could go in, you could try something on. They would do their shopping, and then they'd go back, back to their respective places. And, and so Chicago's role is so important. It was always important for Buck. And, and, and it's, it's just a special city. It is just a special city. It is so connected to this story as Ruth Foster, who formed the Negro Leagues, owned the Chicago American Giants, lived and died there in Chicago, started this thing here in Kansas City in 1920. And, and so, and of course for Buck, Chicago will always hold a very special place that's near and dear in his heart. And, and so the stories that I share here at the museum today are stories that Buck shared with me. And, and every time I get a chance to share the stories, it, it just keeps him alive in my mind and in my heart. One of my favorite of many Satchel Page stories that Buck would so oftentimes tell, they were playing in the Denver Post Tournament. And so Satchel has his Satchel Page All-Stars they're playing an all-white semi-pro team from the Coors Brewing Company. And so Buck is playing first base for Satchel and his All-Stars. And Buck says the first kid from the Coors team gets into the batter's box. He digs in, says Satchel throws him a fastball. Kid swung as hard as he could, topped it, dribbled it down the third base line. Well, it stays fair. The kid beats it out gets an infield hit. Well, Buck says about that time, one of the kids from the Coors dugout steps out on top of the dugout steps and he yells out, let's beat him. He ain't nothing but an overrated darkie. Well, as many of you know, Satchel's nickname famously for Buck was Nancy. That's a whole nother story. We ain't got time to tell that story. Oh, no. But, <laughs> And I can't tell it as good as Buck does anyway. But anyway, Buck looks over at first base. He says, Satchel looks over at first base. He says, Nancy, did you hear that? Buck said, yes, Satchel, I heard him. He said, Nancy, bring him in. And so Buck says he turns at first base. He motions for the outfield to take a couple of steps in. Satchel looks over at first base. He says, Nancy bring them all the way in. Honest to God's truth, y'all, there were seven guys kneeling around the mound, Satchel and the catcher, and Satchel Page strikes out the side on nine straight pitches. He looks into the coolest dugout and says, overrated darky head. And of course, by now, the kid that said this, he was embarrassed, he was crying, Buck said all the guys came out to apologize to Satchel and his teammate. But Buck O'Neill swore to the day he died that if he had one game to win and any choice of any pitcher from any era, it would be the legendary Leroy Satchel Page. As he would say, you might beat him when he was out there messing around. But when he was locked and loaded, forget about it. Yeah, no, he, he was special. And so I get to share these stories. And while I didn't live them like Buck did, I didn't live them, but I got them firsthand. And so now I get to share these stories. And it is, it, it is one of the things that I think I delight in the most in my day-to-day -day work here at the Negro Leagues Museum is just sharing those stories from the likes of Buck O'Neill and the Monty Irvins of the world and you know, I, I did a couple of interviews and helped Major League Baseball kind of name this team, uh, this all Negro League team that they're doing this simulcast thing with. And I was just on the phone with John Morosi over at Fox Sports earlier this morning before I joined you guys. And we were talking about some of those players who 
I learned so much about through the eyes of Buck O'Neill. You all know that we are in the midst of celebrating what is the 100th anniversary of the birth of those Negro Leagues formed here in 1920. And one of the places that we had set our sights on before coronavirus was going over to Indianapolis, where the first game of that inaugural season was played May 2nd, 1920, between the Indianapolis ABCs and the Chicago American Giants. And the Giants lost that game, 42 to the Indianapolis ABCs. C.I. Taylor's Indianapolis ABCs, and of course, the great Oscar Charleston was a member of that Indianapolis ABC team in 1920. And Oscar Charleston, along with Bullet Rogan here in Kansas City, would really become the Negro League's first two superstars. They, these guys, was, there were other stars, but when you talk Bullet Rogan and you talk Oscar Charleston, they superstars. And we recently discovered that Charleston, whom Buck O'Neill would call the greatest baseball player he ever saw. Now, he thought Willie Mays to be the greatest major leaguer. And as some of you probably are aware, my good friend Joe Posnanski is the author of the Baseball 100 that he's been writing for The Athletic. And it looks like Willie Mays is going to be his choice for number one. And uh, most people believe that Mays was the greatest all-around major leaguer of all time. Of course, his career began with the Birmingham Black Barons in the Negro Leagues. But Buck O'Neill believed Oscar Charleston to be the greatest baseball player he ever saw. Oscar Charleston was an early era Negro Leaguer who could do it all. Consummate five-two guy. Hit for power, hit for average, could feel, could run, could throw. In 1921, he led the Negro Leagues in home runs, triples, doubles, stolen bases, and batting average in the same season. If you were going to compare him to a major league contemporary, he had the defensive abilities of Tris Speaker, the tenacity of Ty Cobb, because he would fight you. He was mean. He would fight you in a heartbeat. And it's so interesting because when he became a manager, he was the total opposite. He was a very nurturing manager, but as a player, he was as fiery as anybody. Yeah, Buck tells a story they were playing in, in Mexico and guy, Charleston's on second base. He's scoring on a single and he, he, the Mexican catcher blocks the plate. Well, Charleston was a big barrel-chested guy. Well, about 5'10", five, 5'11", five, but barrel-chested, strong, could run. Well, he runs over the catcher. Buck said a face mask went one way, chest protector went another way, shin guards went another way. This incites a fight. And so as these players are coming up at Charleston one after another, Charleston's dropping them as they come up to him. Well, the security was the military. And so they finally subdue Charleston and they're getting ready to arrest him when the general of the army comes over and says, leave him alone. Any man that strong, leave him alone. Yeah, and that was Oscar Charleston. Buck says, Charleston, y'all, believe it or not, could take a baseball, put it between both palms, and turn the leather on the baseball. Just freakishly strong. And, and, and so he, he's this five-tool guy. And again, Buck says he never saw a center fielder, including Mays, that could go back on a ball the way Charleston could. Just had uncanny instinct. He just seemed to know where that ball was coming down right off the crack of the bat. And so he played a very shallow center field. So you couldn't bloop it in front of him. And unless you hit it on a rope, you couldn't get it over his head. I know you all remember the great catch that Mays makes in the World Series there in the polo grounds. You could have only made that catch in the polo grounds. That's a home run pretty much every other ballpark. And of course, the great over-the-shoulder basket catch after running a country mile to make the catch, and quite frankly, the throw was actually better than the catch. But everybody remembers the magnitude of the moment and that great over-the-shoulder basket catch. Well, all the old-timers in the Negro League say, 
Had that been Oscar Charleston, he'd have been waiting for that to come down. <laughs> and so we learned that Charleston was buried in a Indianapolis cemetery with a nondescript gravesite. And so part of our centennial celebration, we were going back to Indianapolis on May 2nd, not only to commemorate that very first game in the inaugural game of 1920, but also to put a proper headstone on the gravesite of Oscar Charleston, which we still plan to do. It won't happen now on May 2nd, but we will go back to Indianapolis and put a proper headstone on who many believe to be the greatest baseball player of all time. He was number five, I believe, on Joe's list in his baseball 100. And, and so yet he, he relatively died in anonymity, and as so many of these Negro League players have done. And of course, Dr. Jeremy Crump there in the Chicago area has done a great job with putting headstones on the gravesite of a lot of Negro League players. And as he would say, many of these men played in anonymity. They shouldn't lay their final rest in anonymity. And, and we concur. And so we will go to Indianapolis and put that headstone on the gravesite of Oscar Charleston later on this year. But I want to take some time now and, and, and address, I saw a few questions being kind of piped in and try and answer as many questions as I possibly can in the time that we have. Uh, but as you can all imagine, Buck O'Neill meant the world to me. It is a tremendous honor for me to walk in his shadow. You know, I think uh, my predecessor who was running the museum before me, I, I really do think that he didn't like the idea of running, of, of walking in Buck's shadow. Well, for me, it is an honor to walk in Buck's shadow. And quite frankly, I feel like that, that him looming over me protects me. Yeah, I tell people all the time, a hey, day that goes by that I don't think about Buck O'Neill. And, and I honestly believe that he's guiding my footsteps. You know, there's an old adage that says, the good Lord takes care of babies and food. I'm not sure which category I fall in, but you know, I feel like old Buck is helping me along the way. We've had a tremendous, resurrection of his museum thanks to so many of you all who are supporting it jason included and 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 hopefully we'll continue this great momentum through this very important centennial year we were off to a flying start you have february 13th which was the actual 100th anniversary of the birth of the negro leagues inside the old Paseo ymca right around the corner from where the museum operates we had gone back into the building we've been restoring that building and is going to be the future Buck O'Neill Education and Research Center. And, and so we had the Commissioner of Major League Baseball here, Rob Manfred, Xavier James, who's the Chief Operating Officer for Major League Baseball's Player Association, the Honorable Mayor of Kansas City, Quentin Lucas, legendary Royal, Frank White, who is now the Jackson County Executive here in Kansas City, sits inside of Jackson County. He joined us. The Lieutenant Governor of the state of Missouri was with us. So we had this tremendous delegation of folks helping us commemorate and jumpstart this centennial campaign. And Major League Baseball and the Players Association, of course, announced a joint $1 million gift to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. So now we're off and running, man. This is an important year for us. It was going to be, the, I think, the, the most significant national platform that this museum has ever had. And perhaps the biggest thing to happen to this museum since we built the new museum in 1997, and of course, Buck O'Neill's death in 2006. So we're off and running, and who would know, a little less than a month, everything is shut down. Yeah, and, and, and of course, some of you may be aware that part of the celebration featured uh, a game that was going to be played on May on June 27th, when all 30 major league teams, in an unprecedented show of solidarity for the Negro Leagues, were going to pay honor to the Negro Leagues by wearing our centennial uh, Negro Leagues patch on their shoulder. And, and I think this was going to be a watershed moment for Negro Leagues history and for the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. We're all very hopeful that baseball will be played at some point in time this season. 
I'm not exactly sure if we're going to get that day of recognition or not. I know as we hopefully get this game being played, we'll start to look at those opportunities. But I was just as proud of getting that done as much as I was the million dollar contribution. And don't get me wrong, the, the money will go to great use and we need it. But man, to do this, to have the teams and the players and the fans essentially tip their cap to the Negro Leagues. And as we all know in this world of baseball, there's nothing more honorable than a simple tip of the cap. And, and to see baseball do that to pay homage to the Negro Leagues, I think was going to be tremendously significant. I hope that we don't lose that opportunity this year, but we will salvage as much of this centennial celebration as we possibly can. And, you know, we are hopefully this thing will pass us here sooner than later and we'll get back to the business of celebrating this important and rich heritage of our sport. Man, oh man. Uh, Bob, let's do this. I've scooped up some questions for you from the chat. Yes. And then uh, for folks on the phone, uh, what I'll do after that, if we don't have too much chaos, is I'm gonna unmute everybody all at once. <laughs> that way, if you have a question, you can ask it live to Bob. Uh, if you don't have a question, you might want to remute yourself, and, and that'll just keep the noise down. So, Bob, uh, I have a question from Lorraine. She, she would love to learn more about Buck O'Neill. She wonders if you have a book you would recommend or a biography. Two books, Lorraine. Uh, I would recommend his classic book, uh, his biography, I Was Right on Time, and then The Soul of Baseball, written by my friend Joe Posnanski, which is a look into the spirit of Buck O'Neill. It's a baseball book but it's more a book about loving and living through the eyes of Buck O'Neill. And it's a, e, both are very easy reads. I think you will enjoy them. I, people who have read both books have said they've been kind of life altering for them uh, because that incredible spirit that we know of Buck comes across so beautifully. Joe Paz followed Buck and I pretty much around the country the summer of 2005, uh, basically keeping a diary for this book that would become the soul of baseball. It, was the, it won the Casey Award in 2008. Unfortunately, Buck had passed away before the book came out, but it won the Casey Award as the best baseball book of 2008. And, and, and Joe so smartly kept a diary. You know, and it's so interesting because that summer, we were literally gone the entire summer. And, and honestly, I was lamenting how much we were gone. We were on the road constantly. But after he passes away that very next year, you now reflect and you realize, man, that was the greatest summer of my life. I spent the entire summer traveling with Buck O'Neill and they paid me to do it. Now they didn't pay me much, but they paid me to do it. I would have done it for free, you know? And, and all the stories and the wisdom and the chance encounters that we were having and you know, I was there for the ride. I saw this time and time again. We would go places. And even if people didn't know who Buck O'Neill was, they were drawn to him. Yeah, they were drawn to him. And, and we'd go and we'd be sitting in the airport. And if he didn't know you, he'd walk over and he'd introduce himself to you. And by the time we were going to our gates, it, was, it would be as if they'd known each other their entire lives. They're sharing an embrace as they were leaving. That, that was Buck O'Neill. And, and so one day we were in a Washington, D.C. TV station. We were doing some promotion for our mobile museum that we were doing with, our, with Roadway. And so we had gone in, done an interview. Well, we're walking out. And as Buck customarily would do, he stopped and talked to the receptionist. And, and, and so what happens? In walks Linda Carter, Wonder Woman. Yeah, Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman walks in. Buck didn't know who Wonder Woman was. Wonder Woman didn't know who Buck was. Buck introduces himself. I'm Buck O'Neill. What's your name? She says, I'm Linda Connor. They start up a conversation. And before we leave the TV station, Wonder Woman then jumped in the arms of Buck O'Neill and they're sharing an embrace. I saw this, y'all, everywhere I went. There was this spirit, there was this wonderful kindred spirit about this man. You knew he was somebody, but you, even if you didn't know who he was, you wanted to just gravitate 
to him. There was nothing standoffish about Buck O'Neill. It was very engaging and very inviting. He loved people and people loved him. And so both of those books, these wonderful stories will come out in both of those books. And so I highly recommend both of those uh, because they're number one, they're very easy reads. And I can't wait to hear what you all think about the book uh, once you have gotten a chance to read them. Thank you. And then Bob, I'll just add, it wasn't a question, but Lorraine added for all the, all the folks on this call, Membership to the museum is not that expensive. Everybody should no, join. If that's something no, you enjoy. No, you can, you can join as a member for as little as $25. And, and for me, membership is one of the most important things that you can do for any organization. Because in, in some ways, even as a nonprofit organization, when you become a member, you become a stakeholder. You know, you've made an investment that you believe that this, this cause is worthy. And, and you, that you're going to say, all right, I'm going to commit some resources, no matter how much it is on an annual basis to keep the legacy of the Negro Leagues alive. And so at this time when we are closed now to the public and we can't generate the admissions that we would typically do, you know, it's, it's a great time if you have the ability, the wherewithal to consider making a contribution to the museum. You can do so online at nlbm.com and, and, and certainly we uh, absolutely appreciate that consideration. So thank you, Lorraine. Okay, Bob. Uh, Ryan had a question. Uh, what did the Ken Burns documentary mean to you, and what did it mean to Buck? Oh, it meant everything. It was really the platform that introduced us to Buck O'Neill. And as Buck would say, Bob, I've been telling these stories for 40 years, and nobody ever listened. Ken Burns gave him a platform, and people listened. And they fell in love with Buck O'Neill, this very charming, gentle man who was telling these wonderful stories to baseball fans that they'd never heard before. And y'all, he did it with a twinkle in his eye and a smile that lit up the screen and America literally fell in love with Buck. He was 82 years old at that time. And, and it jettisoned an entire new career for Buck. And God blessed him to live for another 12 years as he was gallivanting all over the country preaching the gospel of the Negro Leagues and the virtues of his museum to any and everybody who would listen. And it's all due to Ken Burns. And, and what Ken Burns did that I think others who had worked on Negro League projects seemingly didn't understand was he said, Buck, I wasn't there. You tell the story the way you remember it. And man, it came across so eloquently, so beautifully, and so authentic. He stole the show. The, the documentary was outstanding, but there is no question that Buck O'Neill stole the show. And I'll never forget the headline in the Kansas City Star after the premiere, after Buck's segment came on, says, a star is born at 82. <laughs> I love it. Um, let me give you one from Bruce. Uh, Bruce wanted to know when Buck was part of the College of Coaches with the Chicago Cubs, did he express any disappointment to you about not being an on-the-field coach, coaching first or coaching third? Like one of the few times. One of the yeah. few times that I've ever heard Buck be a little bit sullen was when he reflected on that, that opportunity that never came about. Uh, because I think they were concerned that if Buck got on the field, they, may never, they, not, they might not get him off the field. He could have been easily the first black manager as well. And, and Buck knew that organization as well as anyone. And, and so, yeah, he was disappointed. I've only heard Buck uh, somewhat sullen two times when he talked about what was really an ill-fated idea, that old college coach's notion. And I remember Ebony Magazine asked Buck what he thought about it. Well, of course he had to say, yes, it's a good idea, although he never thought it was a good idea. He never thought that was a good idea. It was actually a terrible idea, but you got to be a competent man. That's who paying you. That's who paying you. And so he told Ebony that it was a good idea. And, and of course, when he gets passed over, uh, that hurt him. And I think it was one of the reasons why he eventually went back to scouting. Yeah, uh, I think that whole notion kind of, kind of sullen him a little bit. And, and the other, uh, only other time that I ever heard him somewhat sullen when it was, was when he talked about his war experience. Buck served in the Navy during World War II. And, and as many of you are aware, African-American soldiers, when they came back home, they were treated terribly. 
and, and the POWs were actually treated better than they were. As Buck would say, the POWs were sitting in the front of the bus. They were relegated to the back of the bus after having served courageously for this country. And, and so those are probably the only two times that I've ever heard him somewhat sullen. And that wouldn't last very long. And then he'd go back to being Buck. He'd go back to being Buck. Yeah. Fantastic. Let me give you uh, one from Ryan from the chat, and then I think we'll try and open it up a little more to folks waiting patiently on the phone. Ryan wants to know, do you think Buck will get into the Hall of Fame eventually, maybe even 2021? Well, Ryan, what we're thinking is, and we got our fingers crossed, that Buck is, of course, on the, I, guess, I always forget the name of this committee. It's kind of the Golden Era Committee that they put together. Buck is on that list, and, and that they meet during the winter meetings in December. So by December, we will know whether or not Buck, and I believe Minnie Minoso is also on that list, whether both of those guys, and I got my fingers crossed and hope that both of them get into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, and I'm, you know, it, it's kind of self-serving on my part because it gives me a celebration to plan for 2021. If Buck O'Neill gets in the Hall of Fame, we get to plan a Buck O'Neill Hall of Fame celebration that we probably would have had in 2006 that we will now get to have in 2021. And, and so, you know, I just told you, the good Lord takes care of babies and fools. And so, <laughs> so while Corona might hurt some of the things that we're doing in 2020, if Buck gets into the Hall of Fame, it creates cause for another celebration in 2021. And any of you who understand how not for profits work, we are always looking for an anniversary or a special cause that we can build a fundraising program around. We will make up an anniversary if we think it'll help us raise money. And, and you know, that's just kind of what we do. But these will both be legitimate opportunities for us to keep the party going. And so we all hope that Buck gets in. You know, and Joe Paz and I talk about this all the time. And will it be as significant to me as it would have been in 2006 when he was alive? No, it won't, I'll be honest. But for his fans who have been so vigilant, Buck has been gone, he's he, he been gone now almost 14 years. And his fans are just as vigilant today as they were in 2006 when he didn't get in that he belongs in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. So how could you not be excited for those who would feel like their voices have finally been heard, that they have been vindicated? So now, now naturally, you have to then, your spirits have to fall in line with that. But you know what I missed, and, and most of us, when he didn't get in 2006, man, we wanted to high five with our guy. We wanted to hug. We wanted to chest bump with our guy, and we didn't get that opportunity to do that. And, and, and it's almost like when you lose a loved one. More times than not, we're not mourning for the person that died. We're mourning for the fact that we've lost someone that we care about. And I think a lot of that was certainly the case when he didn't get in the Hall of Fame. We wanted to celebrate with our guy, and we didn't get that opportunity to do that. But his spirit is just so omnipresent that it would be impossible not to be joyous. And like I said, for me, it builds a celebration that we can hopefully parlay into greater support for Buck's Museum. <laughs> Fantastic. Bob, let me, let me try this. And folks on the phone, I'm, I'm learning Zoom as we go, but I think you actually do have the power to unmute yourself. So let's do this. If you don't have a question, stay on mute. But if you do, uh, one at a time, let's hope, throw a question to Bob, and we'll see how many we can get through. Tom, are you there with the question? Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, so, so stepping outside of the players in the, the New League museums um, or their, their league, who are some of the executives, like, in the front office that were making the decisions on the day-to-day? -day, oh, yeah. Uh, with the and, and, you know, and Tom, that's a great question, man, because, again, it's a side that is overlooked, you know, because it's so easy to get lost in the romantic nature of these very courageous athletes who, as I like to say, forged a glorious history in the midst of an inglorious time in American history 
that we do lose sight that this was a business operation and it was a thriving black business operation. And so you did have uh, great executives who were running the Negro Leagues. And of course, it starts, of course, with Ruth Foster, who may be the most brilliant mind in baseball history. Ruth Foster, guys, who lived and died in Chicago, as I mentioned, was light years ahead of his time. Ruth Foster, in the early era of black baseball, had been a great player himself, a great pitcher. Uh, as a matter of fact, he is credited with having invented what we now know to be the screwball. Back then, it was called a fadeaway. And Rube perfected this pitch, so much so that the great Major League manager, John McGraw, snuck Rube into his camp so that Rube Foster could teach Christy Matheson how to throw the screwball. Christy Matheson threw the pitch all the way into the National Baseball Hall of Fame that he learned from Rube Foster. But Foster was best known as this visionary, this tremendous leader. He would own the Chicago American Giants. He would manage the Chicago American Giants. He would become president of the Negro Leagues. So you'll be hard pressed to find anyone who contributed more to the game of baseball than Rube Foster. You can make a legitimate case that Rube Foster may be the most influential person ever in this game. Because, you know, unlike Ricky, Foster was a great player. Yeah, Foster likely would have gotten in the Hall of Fame for his playing career, no less these other things that he did. And he's one of the most brilliant minds in baseball history. Yeah, when Rube Foster formed the Negro Leagues in 1920, he either had booking rights or ownership of four of the original eight Negro League teams. He essentially divested ownership of three, kept the Amer Chicago American Giants, and then in a deal with the Negro Leagues, was paid 5% of the annual gate. In 1920 alone, y'all, over 400,000 fans attended Negro League games. Yeah, I'm from Crawfordville, Georgia. Crawfordville, Georgia, all about 500 people. So I ain't that good at math. But if you getting 5% of 400,000, you doing pretty good. And, and Rube ran the Negro Leagues like a tyrant. He really did. He handled every aspect of business operations. And while the Negro League was having unprecedented success, there were some within the ranks who thought Rube Foster was too powerful. They had too much control. And so the story has it that he's on league business in 1925. And he's exposed in Indianapolis. He's exposed to a gas leak in his hotel room. A passerby comes by, smells the gas, kicks in, brings him out. Well, when he comes out, he's unconscious. When he finally comes to, he was never the same. Yeah, never the same. Likely suffered brain damage and then was subject to having fits of violent outrage, causing his family to ultimately have to put him in an insane asylum. So one of the most brilliant men in baseball history dies in an insane asylum. I tell people all the time, you can't make this stuff up. But there is great belief that the gas leak wasn't accidental, that somebody tried to take old Rube out. Yeah, and, and, but Rube's brilliance is still being felt in this game. How far ahead he was thinking, Tom? When he organized the Negro Leagues in 1920, he thought he would create a league that was so dynamic that he would force Major League Baseball's hand to expand. And so think, in this case, the NFL and the old AFL. And for basketball fans, the NBA and the ABA, that you would absorb these Black teams, and then those teams that didn't get in, you would disperse those players. You would have created some powerful, Black teams. Yeah. And under Foster's model, you would have had complete integration of this game in the 1920s. So you would have not only had Black players, you would have had Black owners, Black managers, Black coaches, team physicians. Every aspect of this game would have been influenced by Black folks at the major league level under Foster's model. Uh huh. And he was almost right. Instead, they focus on the field, and then it's 15 years after Jackie that you finally get Buck O'Neill 
as the first black coach. Yeah, 1962. And then it's 13 years later that you get Frank Robinson as the game's first manager, 1975. And, and so the hierarchy of this sport didn't get much of an opportunity. It was focused on the field. But other great owners, J.L. Wilkinson, who owned the Kansas City Monarch, the only white owner of the original eight Negro League franchises. And, and, and honestly, y'all, Foster really did not want any white ownership, but he relented because he kept hearing these great things about J.O. Wilkinson. I, I characterize J.O. Wilkinson in this manner. He was a 2000 man in the 1900s. He didn't see color. He really did. And, and he had made his entire living in black baseball. And, and Buck O'Neill would say of J.O. Wilkinson that he was the first white man that he ever met who had no prejudice. Said when there weren't enough hotel rooms to go around, they slept in the same bed together. And, and then, so Foster's hearing all these great things about Wilkinson, but then the other thing that Wilkinson had that Foster needed was access to stadiums. And so Foster would relent. Wilkie, as we call him, would become the secretary of the Negro Leagues. He would bring in his charter, Kansas City Monarchs, one of the greatest baseball franchises, not in Negro Leagues history, but in baseball history. Folks, they had one losing season in their almost 40 year existence in the Negro Leagues. Sent more guys to the major leagues than any other Negro League franchise. There are those who will say that the Kansas City Monarchs were the New York Yankees of the Negro Leagues. There are others who will say that the New York Yankees were the Kansas City Monarchs of the Major League. They were that good. And it would be J.L. Wilkinson who would pioneer night baseball in the Negro Leagues five years before they ever played a night game in the Major Leagues. They were playing them in the Negro Leagues thanks to J.L. Wilkinson who literally mortgaged everything he had to pioneer night baseball, portable generated light towers. So not only could they play a night game here, they could load them up on the truck and play a night game virtually anywhere. And then there were a host of other great baseball executives, the Martin brothers in Memphis who built their own stadium, Martin Stadium, uh, there in Memphis. You had C.I. Taylor, who I spoke about earlier, and his uh, Indianapolis ABCs. C.I. Taylor dies early, and, and his wife would inherit the team and run the team. You had Gus Greenlee, who would create the East-West All-Star Game that, of course, was heralded because it was played virtually every year in Chicago. Uh, so a lot of great executives. And then you had Effa Manley, the first woman to be nominated and inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. She and her husband, Abe, owned the Newark Eagles. Mrs. Manley ran the day-to-day -day operations of that baseball team, and she knew the business of baseball as well as any man. Tremendous talent play for her. Larry Doby, my dear friend, the late, great Monty Irvin, Leon Day, Willie Wells. These players are all in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Don Newcomb should be in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. All played for Effa Manley's Newark Eagles. So yeah, you had a litany of great executives uh, there in the Negro Leagues. And you have to remember, this was the third largest Black-owned business in this country at that time. So yeah, it's, uh, it's such an amazing story that encompasses quite a bit beyond the baseball field. That's awesome. Bob, would you have time for one last question from yeah, home? Yeah, no, no, I'm good. Home is, is what's showing up. So home, take yeah, it no, away. No, you got I'm some good. sweet I'm merchandise good. in the background. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon, Mr. Kendrick. Hey. Um, <laughs> How you doing, Mr. Kendrick? It's really good to see you. Mr. Swartz, thank you very much for doing this. It's a pleasure to see uh, Mr. Kendrick and you. Um, I was wondering, uh, with the season being as it is, if you had considered extending this uh, celebration even include next year's baseball season. Yeah, I, I think that's likely the case. I just had that discussion with my board uh, this past Thursday, as a matter of fact. And this is such a significant opportunity for the museum, and we don't want to miss what is a paramount opportunity. And, and I say that from the standpoint that the platform and the profile was going to chart a course that will help this museum operate in perpetuity. 
And, and it is literally a once in a 100 year opportunity. And we wanna try and take, as, uh, uh, take advantage of that opportunity. So it is highly likely that you'll see this stage carrying on through 2021. And again, particularly if Buck O'Neill gets into the Hall of Fame, which creates an even greater cause to do so. Uh, but even if it doesn't, and, and I, you know, it's so funny because I have to prepare myself mentally, emotionally, of what happens if he doesn't get in. You know, it took a lot out of me in 2006 when he didn't get in, and then subsequently he's sick and he passes on. And, and you kind of reflect on that. And I told Joe Paz, man, I don't know if I can go through that again. You know, it just was so emotionally draining uh, in so many ways. And, and, and so, you know, so, but you do have to prepare because as we well know, there's no shoe in with anything. Anytime that people are making a decision, they voting on something, you never know what the outcome is going to be. But yeah, no, we, we're certainly, Ernie, looking at extending the celebration into 2021. All right, let me do this. Uh, I'm hoping, Bob, can you see my picture of Buck? I just yeah, I can, I can, and, and if you got some more questions, I'm good, Jason. I, oh, I, oh man, okay, all no, right. Well, what no. the heck? If somebody wants to unmute and, and take another question, go for it. Uh, Bob, this is Richard Smiley. Uh, my question is, uh, what, what is, uh, where does John Dan uh, Donaldson stand? in terms of Negro League history? Like, where would you rank him compared to some of the other stars there? Yeah, you see, he doesn't get as much love for the Negro Leagues because much of his work was done pre-Negro League. Mm -hmm. But John Donaldson is one of the greatest pitchers in baseball history who should absolutely be in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. And, and thanks uh, to the work of the Donaldson Network, uh, you know, they've done yeoman's duty of now putting the data behind you know, much of the Negro Leagues is built on lore and legend. But what they've done now through work, through some great work, uh, they've very, you know, they've got over 400 verifiable wins for John Wesley Donaldson. Great left-handed pitcher. And, and, you know, how good was John Donaldson? To be honest, J.L. Wilkinson held him in an even higher regard than Satchel. But see, you have to understand that John Donaldson made a lot of money for J.L. Wilkinson. Yeah, he was almost like a hired hand. So I think, you know, Wilkie might have been a little bit biased because of the relationship that he had with Donaldson where he made him so much money. But, you know, you're right. John Donaldson is, is certainly in the top five Negro League pitchers of all time. Uh, but he did most of his work in that pre-era of the Negro League, so he doesn't get as much love. And that's the case with the 19th century ball players and even the early era Negro leaguers because the people who saw them, they were long gone. So they don't get nearly as much love. So you hear the players at Buck O'Neill and the Monty Irvers of the world, they were their contemporaries. They're the guys that they talk about more often. And so the, the likes of a John Donaldson and Pete Hill and guys from that era, they don't get as nearly as much love as they should. But Donaldson was great, and I too believe he should be in the Hall of Fame. All right. Anybody else from the audience? Uh, hi, Bob. TJ Valachek here. Uh, hey, just wondering, you. maybe other than Satchel, who are some of Buck's favorite teammates? Oh man, he loved Hilton Smith. Hilton Smith was a dear friend of his, and and, and so yeah, he absolutely adored Hilton Smith. They were more or less roommates when they traveled together. Um, he, 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 he loved Connie Johnson. Uh, Connie was on that team in, in 1942, along with Jim Lefty, Lamarck, Jack Matchett, Booker McDaniel, that formed one of the greatest pitching staffs, along with Satchel and Hilton Smith, uh, Willard Brown. And, and he always joked about Willard Brown. Willard Brown was in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. And as Buck would say, Willard Brown, he batted behind Willard Brown. And Willard Brown would hit the home run and he knew he was going down. He just didn't know what pit they were going to throw at you. That's the way they played in the Negro League. And so Willard Brown would hit the home run, but would get knocked down. And so as he said, I knew I was going to get knocked down. I just didn't know which pitch it was going to happen on. And of course, he had great admiration for Frank Duncan, 
who had played for, had been a great catcher for the Monarch, but then by the time Buck really gets into his, you know, kind of big into his career, Frank Duncan had become the manager of the Monarchs. He was managing that 42 team. And, and of course, you know, as you said, Satchel, he and Satchel had a, a, a special bond, a very special relationship. But, you know, Buck was always a great teammate. And so it was very easy for folks to get along with Buck O'Neill, and he got along with everybody. Man, so Bob, there was a question in the comments that said, uh, when are we going to have a part two? Well, it looks like the part two is going on right now, Bill. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is Dennis up in Milwaukee. Yeah, Dennis. Hi, uh, Dennis. Hi there, Bob. Thank you so much. Um, you made my weekend. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, but I think you'd make anybody's weekend any weekend, not just weekend during the virus. And normally when we have speakers at our meetings, when it's over, we give a round of applause. And before this thing's over, everybody, if you can unmute your PC and your phone and just let's give Bob a big round of applause. Because thank you very much, Bob. This is wonderful. And then I'm, just, I, I'm happy to see people. So I'm just as glad, I'm just as glad to see y'all and y'all ought to see me. <laughs> <laughs> Man, oh man! All right, do we do we have one or two more for Bob? If not, I got a few closing remarks, but but I don't want to shut you out. So if you got, I have a question. If you can hear me, yes, uh, Bob, this has been fantastic. I appreciate you doing this for us. Um, I live close to Jason, and he has talked up the museum. I can't wait to get out there, and was hoping to be able to get out for the Hall of Game, but I don't know if that's going to happen or not. But yeah, I guess my no question is. With regard to the museum, I haven't been able to visit yet. Uh -huh. Sometimes it seems like it's difficult to come by actual archive footage of the games being played or of the players during the time that they played. Is there an archive at the museum where we could kind of watch some of this stuff? No, man, I'll tell you what, it is hard. That stuff, so much of that stuff has been lost to time that we have a little bit of footage that, are, that is featured in some of our films here at the museum. And, and that stuff is owned by film houses. Um, you know, there's probably somebody right now sitting on some old film footage in, in their homes, in their attic, in the basement somewhere. Uh, and it would be a treasure trove to be able to get and restore. It's just not a lot of it out there, unfortunately. And, and so particularly of games and action and that kind of thing. And so, you know, uh, we're constantly scouring, trying to find not only the film, but even the artifact uh, memorabilia to try to secure. And, and as you can well imagine, we've become our own worst enemy. With the success that we've had, we've helped now popularize the Negro Leagues to a point where we're driving up the price for these rare artifacts and acquisitions that makes it too difficult for us to go out and get them. Uh, and so, <laughs> but that's okay. You know, that's the byproduct of trying to disseminate this information. And I would much rather for people to know the history of the Negro Leagues, even if it's at a cost of the fact that we won't be able to go out and buy these artifacts because the prices are just extraordinary. Now, anytime that there's a three-dimensional object, we know that it's going to be a challenge for the museum to go get it. So we have to be very prude, we have to be very kind of stealth-like in how we go about trying to identify what we want to go out and go after uh, a lot of financial records and those kinds of things are things that we've set outside. And one of the things I forgot to mention, we opened in February a new exhibit here called Black Baseball in Living Color. And it features the remarkable works of a incredible young artist named Greg Kreinler, who does what he calls color studies. And he goes back, and these go back to the 19th century, he researches and find these portraits, and then he brings them and does it through his research, he colorizes them. But they've done so by hand painting. They're all hand painted pictures, and, and they are just extraordinary. And so that exhibit opened in, on February 13th to rave reviews, but it was underwritten by a collector named Jay Codwell. And some of you may have seen me on Twitter post the fact that, that if, if there is a holy grail of Negro Leagues memorabilia, it is actually on display as part of this exhibit. It is the complete financial records of Roop Foster and the Negro National League from 1920 to 1925. Mm. These records were meticulously kept. 
and it paints a picture again of the thriving, thriving nature of what the enterprise, the, the, the Negro Leagues enterprise was all about. Because again, we talked about that in, in the previous question. That's the side that is often seemingly forgotten about. That is actually on display. Trust me, I am trying to work some magic to see if we can keep that financial journal, that ledger here at the Negro Leagues Museum after this exhibit closes. It was originally scheduled to close May 31st. It is now going to close July 19th. So we've extended it in hopes that we'll get past this coronavirus and that people will be able to kind of come out and get to experience. This exhibit is absolutely incredible. And so I hope people get to see it. But yeah, film footage is so difficult to come by uh, just as some of the other pieces of memorabilia. Let's see, uh, Michael, I think maybe I saw your hand go up. You'd need to unmute yourself or I can, I'll can. i unmute you if, if it works. I think you may need to do it on your end. Uh, if you had a question, no, nah, no, nah, you're good. Okay, uh, well, any, any last uh, takers? I'd like to do two things, maybe three, depends how you count them. Obviously, I gotta thank Bob for his graciousness in making this presentation. I think, Bob, you lifted everybody's spirits just as I hoped you would and just as you always do. I just want to acknowledge our, our program. We're calling it Stay Home with Sabre in terms of trying to bring good baseball content, good quality baseball content to you wherever you are without you having to leave the house or do anything unsafe. Um, I'm going to make a quick prediction. Uh, myself, Bob got asked about Buck. Yeah, I, th I think Buck will be in the Hall of Fame, but I'm going to take my prediction to another level. The Hall of Fame, of course, does give out awards for people who are talented with the microphone. I think before it's all said and done, if Bob keeps doing what he's doing, I think we may see Bob's <laughs> name at some point in the Hall of Fame, right? So uh, I, want, I want to point, if y'all can see the screen, I just want to let you know, right? It's a theme you've heard a little bit, but uh, you know, part of what I was hoping would happen in bringing everybody together, talking about Buck, Chicago, the Negro Leagues, is build some excitement for uh, Bob's museum. I put the link here, nlbm.com donations. Bob brought us uh, probably the best Buck of all, but you could return the favor with some Bucks of your own. <laughs> and then just to, um, to really close it out, um, and this is kind of like what Dennis was saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna test my um, skills here. Um, you know, Bob hasn't seen a lot of people these days. He usually greets tons of visitors every day. So if you feel like turning on your camera, uh, you know, the meeting sometimes is smoother without it because we lose some quality. But at this point, we're pretty much at the end. If you want to turn on your camera, uh, Bob will get a chance to see some, some more of the faces that we're yeah, on. No, man, that's outstanding. Yeah. Guys, I, I really can't thank you all enough for inviting me to be a part of this. What a brilliant idea, this whole stay home with Saber kind of piece that you guys are doing. And, and, and again, uh, this was uh, just as meaningful for me as I hope it was for you all. Because, uh, you know, I, like I said, I'm just happy to see people. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Bob, you, you are always welcome back in our living rooms, man caves, dining room tables, or wherever folks are right now. And then for folks on the phone, if your friends missed out, I'm about to stop the recording so I can get it posted. You'll see it on the Sabre Chicago Facebook page. You'll see it on my Twitter, which is heavyj28. Uh, but then I think it'll spread and hopefully you'll see it all kinds of places. But feel free to share the recording and uh, hopefully everybody get a chance. Bob, thank you once again. Guys, thank, thank you. Thanks to everybody on the phone. Thank you. Stay thank safe. You, Bob. Bye, Bob. Stay safe. Absolutely. Thanks, Bob. You're thanks, Bob. Thanks, right. Bob. Hey, Mr. Kennedy. You're welcome, Ernie.